Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us for the timeless Jewish tradition of going to the movies on Christmas. Now that you've watched the iconic 1983 musical Yentl, sit back and enjoy an interview with Nehemiah Persoff, a 102-year-old Hollywood legend who plays Barbara Streisand's father in the film. Nehemiah is in conversation with Maddie Kahn, a writer, editor, and contributor at Glamour, and author of a forthcoming book about teen girls and activism from Viking Books. Maddie, over to you. Well, I am so happy to be in conversation with you this afternoon uh, and for the people watching this evening, if that's when they're choosing to watch this. I think the first thing I want to start with is your kind of unconventional upbringing. You were born in pre-state Palestine. And just to orient people, because I know this is interesting for those folks who are watching, tell me a little bit about growing up there, because uh, that's far, far away from Hollywood. Yeah. Well, uh, I have to tell you that I was born in Jerusalem, which, had, which was a city that had a, a kind of a holiness all over it. You just look at the place and you see, you just see what's called in Hebrew Shekhinah. You see the holiness of the place. And uh, also I was exposed to the Koran, the Jewish uh, Bible, uh, immigrants from all over the world. There were immigrants at that time from Russia who were influenced by the Zionist call of the late 18th century. And they left their country and came to whatever, to Israel, to Palestine, to build, rebuild the Jewish homeland. And they were full of new ideas on how to live. They came post the revolution in Russia and they had ideas about collectives and how to raise children, whether to have newborn children immediately go to their mother or to the nurse and live in the nurse for a while, or whether to uh, boys and girls should bathe together, all kinds of things like that, all kinds of forward ideas on how to live. And at age 10, I was full of all of these ideas that a, a child of 10 should not have. I was full of the burden of different ways of living. When I came to the United States, I met the American boys and they had no principle. They knew nothing about the glory of the Jewish history. They knew nothing about dignity of soul. They were just depression kids. At the time was the time of the early depression and then the terrible depression came. And so that's it. And how did you get from that childhood to Hollywood? When did you first fall in love with acting? I was an actor all my life, actually. I tell in the book about a time when I was three years old that I remember, three years old. I went to kindergarten. I had a teacher that's just beautiful. And she was tall and lovely, but she didn't give me enough attention. So I got on a trike and rode in circles, circles, till I fell down and pretended that I was hurt. And then she picked me up and fed me. And I loved that. And since then, I've learned that I have a certain power of pretending the truth to people. And if they believe me, then I've achieved my goal. So that's, I sensed that I was an actor all along. But in Palestine at that time, the Jewish people came to rebuild their country, but also to rebuild the nation because they had been in exile for so long and they were forced to work not in the crafts at all, but they had to, they were forced to be peddlers and storekeepers and sellers. And they came here and they wanted to rebuild the Jewish nation. And in that way, they wanted to make labor, labor, work, work with your hands, a very important part of them. So I was determined, it was drummed in my head that labor was the way to go and I was gonna be a worker. When I came to the United States, I was asked if I wanted to go to uh, uh, a high school that's uh, uh, a regular high school or a trade school. And being a worker, I wanted to go to trade school. I went to a trade school. There I learned to be an electrician. And after I left, I worked as an electrician, but I hated it. 
I thought then that maybe I'm not good with my hands, but I will be with my hands. So I, I, I learned to be, I, I studied for the entrance exam to Cooper Union, which is a university. And a university that uh, for uh, um, scientists. I passed the exam, went to the first meeting, and there I saw all the gooks around me, odd looking people. And the guy spoke for about an hour and I was bored to death, I hated it. And so I left that night and I never, after all the work, never went back again for another lecture. But I took the information that I had when I passed and I took an exam for the, for the New York subway. I passed that and got into the New York subway. There I worked 12 to eight and um, the people, they were altogether different from the people I knew in New York. These were with the railroad workers who came to the subway in New York. Most of them lived out in Long Island and they were very different from the people I knew in New York and they seemed funny to me and I used to tell stories about them to parties wherever I went. And one night, this girl that I knew came to me and said, you know, you are wasting your time in, a, in the subway. Why don't you become an actor? I said, no, I don't. I'm inside, I was dying to be an actor. I wanted to, but the profession seemed something for uh, British people who spoke so well and not, not to foreigners, not to people like me. So finally, here I go, where was I, people? You were talking about um, how someone asked you, said, enough with the subway and it's time oh, to yes, yes, be an actor. Yes, 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 yeah. yes, 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 yes. She told me to meet this lady at the, at the arts, at the acting school. And inside I was dying to do it, but I said, no, 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 no. And she finally persuaded me. And I went and I told the lady that I was an electrician. And she said, would you like to put a light up on the hall, at the end of the hall? And I said, yes. And she said, for that, we'll give you a, 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 a tuition free. Wow. So, what? That's amazing. Great deal. Yeah. So I did. And, and uh, I, in the class, I did an improvisation about a guy I know from Brooklyn. And it was very funny. And the teacher who at times directed on Broadway uh, 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 asked me, who writes your material? And I said, no, nobody writes my material. This is a guy that I knew. Well, two months later, I was working on the 59th Street stop of the subway. And someone on the platform said, hey, Nikki, what the hell are you doing down there? And it was Mel Ward, the guy, the director. And he said, do you want a job in a Broadway play? And I said, sure. He said, come down tomorrow to the theater. I'm directing a play there. And I went the next morning and signed and got the job and began to work with people that I knew from Hollywood. And that was very exciting for me. What was that your is, question? No, that's <laughs> such a thrill. I mean, you answered it, you answered it perfectly. I know that over the course of your career, you've played several Jewish roles. Obviously, Yentl is one of the most prominent. Um, how did you come to those roles and what was your relationship like to playing so many Jewish characters? Well, I have a long answer for that. For that I'd like to tell you an anecdote. My father was an actor in Russia. He had several friends and together they formed in Russia at the age of 17, I think, a little theater group. After a while, they all decided that they wanted to go to Palestine, they were Zionists. And so they stowed on a ship and went and got let off in uh, Turkey. Yeah, they were there a few months and then they went to uh, Baghdad. No, not Baghdad, but in Syria, the capital of Syria is what? Oh, you're testing my knowledge. Uh, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't prepare for that question. It's anyway, been a long time since Syria, I was Syria, Syria, Syria was under uh, French rule at that time, so French was spoken. And after a while, they all learned French. They took a comedy by Molier, the miser, and my father played the lead. And they acted that for a while, and that kept them alive. That, then they decided to go to Jerusalem, which is a three-week walk or something, and they walked. They walked to Jerusalem, and there they established the first Hebrew-speaking theater in modern-day Israel, Palestine. One day, 
they did this, they took the play that they did in, oh, they did a play in, in Syria. And then they did the same play in Israel where my father played the lead in Moliere's The Miser. Mm. Ben Gurion was then, he was the first president of Israel. He was then a newspaper columnist at age 23. He reviewed the play and he said that the young man playing Harpagon, which is the lead, seems to have forgotten that he's playing a Frenchman. He was more of a Jerusalem Jew than a Frenchman. That was the time when the first I heard that he was too Jewish and I had to fight that through my entire career to be very careful not to come through with my Jewish mannerism, which I learned as every child has learned who has parents from a foreign country. They learn from their parents certain expressions, certain motions, certain this, certain that, 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 that. And that, the, the degree of what you reach into that inheritance from your parents, that's the degree that you can do foreign parts from their country. And that's how I came to, that was your question, was it? Yeah, I'm interested just in, I mean, that's so, that's heartbreaking in a way, uh, that review and amazing that Ben Gurion reviewed the play, <laughs> just incredible. Um, but I, I guess I'm also curious what your experience as a Jewish actor in Hollywood was like in those, as you started to get more and more roles. Yeah, well, uh, there was no problem at all at being Jewish in Hollywood. There are a lot of Jews there. Yes. <laughs> Uh, the question of uh, act, whether to use an accent or not was the actor's choice generally. Mm. And the problem of when do you do what kind of accent, how, how far do you go and so on. So let me go down the, the, the path with you. In Voyage of the Damned, where I played a Jewish refugee from Germany, uh, nobody there spoke with an accent, none of the people, and I chose not to use an accent, and it was sufficient. Then uh, I did Yentl, and in Yentl, Barbara Streisand, who was a very meticulous person, a great director, and uh, devoted to her arts, she gave me the part of her father, and uh, I couldn't get into the part while I was reading the play without her. I got to London and uh, I, I was very disturbed because I couldn't really understand the part. A day before shooting, Barbara called me to her house in London and she sat there and we across the table, we had a cup of tea, a glass of tea. And she told me all about her upbringing, her being losing her father at the age of two, how hard it was for her and so on and so on and so on and so on. And she said, let's read. And then we started reading and she wasn't happy with what I was doing. And she said, let's do it again with a little more schmaltz, schmaltz. So I said, ay, yentl, 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 ay, 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 crazy with all these questions and things that you want, yentl. She said, ah, that's it, that's it. And so that was the level of accent that I had in Yentl. And, uh, you know, it was only on the way home that I, re on the plane that I realized that when Barbara told me about her parents losing her father, that she was really directing me. I didn't know it, but she was directing me because when I got through with listening to her, I, I, I understood exactly her problem. And uh, it involved me emotionally. And uh, that's what really set me through that part. And uh, that was about it. Now, there are other, other things that I did. For instance, the uh, uh, LA Law. I'll tell you another story. Do you have time? <laughs> are you, we've got plenty of time, yes. OK, OK. Uh, I was called to Hawaii one year to do a magnum Magnum P.I. There I was called without an audition. The director was uh, Penn, uh, Arthur Penn, not Arthur, but another Penn, Penn, Sean Penn's father. 
he knew me from New York and he hired me and I did the play, the part of a rabbi. And towards the end, the producer came to me and said, look, we didn't know much about this, but if you, you the last scene is that in a cemetery and we didn't know anything about that. Would you please improvise? And if you think that it's wrong, just take it, make it your own. I said, thank you. Thank you for relying on me. And I did it and it was fine. And then I finished that, went to New York. My agent calls me, he says, uh, Fox is doing a show of LA Law and they want to audition you for the part of a moil. A moil is a Jewish, a, a guy who snips and cuts a circumciser. And so I became very angry. I said, why do they want to audition me? I hated to be auditioned. He said, look, I know that you hate it, but you're getting, you're about 70 now, and they don't know whether you have the mind to, to, to learn lines and to speak and so forth. You better do it. So much as I hated it, I put on my rabbi suit, which I had at home, and a hat, and I went there. I was a little late. The first thing the director did was ask me a question with open the door for me, and he said, Mr. Persoff, do you always dress like that for an audition? And I said, no, no, only when I have a job, when I have a work to do. He said, what do you mean? What, what kind of work do you do? I said, I'm a moil. He said, you're a, he turned to the casting director. Did you know that Mr. Persoff was a male, a, a moil? <laughs> and uh, he, she said, no. So then the writer came up to me and said, Mr. Persoff, do you like the script? Is there anything wrong with it? Do they think it's accurate? And I said, mm, that's all right. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. And the director said to me, would you like to read it a little? I said, fine. So I read and he said, after a few lines, I said, that's fine. That's good. Okay. I'm going to call your agent. Thank you very much. So I left. And when I got home, I called my agent. My agent said, Nikki, you never ceased to surprise me. I didn't know you was a moil. And then I, I decided that I'm going to put all those people there to make them think that I'm a real moil. So when we were shooting the scene, if I finished shooting my scene, I'd go to my chair that I sat on the side, put on my hat, got the Bible that I brought with me and started davening, praying. And I prayed, prayed, prayed. And all the people respected me. They gave me a long breath. They went in a big circle around me when they had to pass not too close. And... Uh, at the end of the shooting, one of the guys playing a lawyer came to me and he said, look, we had a baby just two months ago. Would you mind, Rabbi, to bless my baby? I said, no, I'd love to. So we called his wife over. She gave me the little baby. I took the baby and I chuchkit and muchkit with it, chit 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 And then somehow I managed to squeeze out a tear and I made a prayer and gave the baby back to the guy. He gave it to his wife and he gave it to his wife. His wife was full of tears, crying, crying, crying. She was so moved. And that was the story of how I became a moral. That was the Jewish part of Jewishness that I had. Uh, fiddle around the roof, obviously. Uh, let me see, there was... Uh, Gordon, uh, Waxy Gordon and Jay Guzik in Untouchables. Uh, they were foreign. I don't know if they were Jewish. I think Gordon was Jewish, but I didn't. The Jewishness had nothing to do with the part. So I played it on my own accent. I have an accent. People can, people know that I'm Jewish when I speak. But uh, sometimes you do more. You try to, to you try to do less and more. If you're with a bunch of Jewish friends, you can say Mazel Tov or things like that or Hungaria or whatever it is. Uh, but uh, when, when you're with people who are not Jewish, you're careful not to use too many of these expressions because it just doesn't go, you know what I mean? Yes. yes. That's it. Yes, I want to, I, I'm thinking back to bring it back to Yentl since that's the film that everyone listening to this will have just watched. It's, it's so interesting to hear you talk about what Barbara Streisand was like as a director and how careful she was with this project. Had you ever worked with a woman director before her? It was pretty rare back then. With many directors who were as what as she, as she? Had you ever worked with other women directors before Barbara Streisand? Women. 
I think one time, yeah, but they were just directors. She was not a, just a director. She was a person who was on fire. She, she produced, she directed, she wrote, she, she did everything on that. She cast, she, she did everything. And she was so involved that most of the people became annoyed with her because she made demands on the lighting man, for example. Barbara was sitting at the end of the table and uh, there was a light on that side. She looked at the, herself in the monitor and she said to me, look at that face, it's so ugly, look at that nose, but still I'm a movie star, how do you like that? But I don't like the creases on my face. She was 40 years old, she was playing a younger, much, much, much younger person. So, she said to the lighting man, who was a very, very high regarded man, I forgot his name, but she said, look, I want that light moved to the, over there. And he said, why? And they argued a bit and she said, that's what I want, okay? And he put it there and she was right, there were no creases showing. So Barbara knew all of these things. And uh, I think that many people were annoyed. I was not because I'm a perfectionist myself. Mm. So we got along great, great. Uh, at her, uh, uh, she, got, she won this special award from, uh, I forget what, but I was one of the speakers. And I said to her, Barbara, you have been like a daughter to me for over 20 years. You never call, you never write. <laughs> <laughs> she must have laughed. Yeah, that was a big laugh. Yeah. Yes, yes, that's a great line. Um, yeah. That it sounds like an amazing experience to work with someone who's that meticulous. It's. I'm sorry. Hard, I'm hard of hearing. It sounds it like. It sounds what? like it was an amazing experience to work with someone who was so meticulous. Oh yes, yes. Yeah. Let me tell you one of one of the moments that I enjoyed so much was uh, I played a scene in which I died during the scene, and Barbara goes out and sings, "Papa, can you hear me?" So after my scene with her, she, I started to get up and go. She said, no, no, stay in bed. I want you lying down here. And she left into the next room and she began to sing, Papa, can you hear me, Papa? And then she wasn't happy with it. She came back and she touched my head. She ran her, her hand through my hair. She came very close to me and said a few words. And then she went out. And she started singing, Papa, can you hear me? And she's over, not that they were going to use this, but this was to be the pattern she was to follow at the studio when she really recorded that song. But it was so thrilling for me to be there and to feel that I'm part, really part of that song. It's so moving for me. One of the moments in the business that you're happy that you became an actor, really. The time when you feel that you're really communicating with people. Yeah, that's, that's incredible. Mm -hmm. I know that um, you have found other expressions for your creativity. I know that you paint also, um, and you're, you've created wonderful paintings. How did you start painting? Well, uh, I don't know if I told, no, I didn't tell you about my second, I did one one man show, Shalom Aleichem, which was very well received. I won the acting and best show award in San Francisco and New York, in, in LA, a special prize. I traveled all over the world with it, it was very successful. When I was about 70, I began to have to read and audition and so on. and. Uh, I didn't like that, so I decided to do another one-man show. I spent nine months studying it, went to uh, San Diego, hired, rented a theater, hired people to work for me, hired a director. All of it was my effort, my money. And on preview night, there were 11 people in the audience that really threw me. I went to have dinner with my director, and in the middle of our speech, speaking, I couldn't form my words anymore. The words were. 
After 30 seconds, he slapped me around. I came to and I was able to speak. I picked up the phone to call my doctor. He said, leave everything behind you and come back home. And I left everything, everything. Nine months work, I left, I come home and he sent me to a specialist. A specialist said, I want you out of Los Angeles because I don't think that you should be acting anymore. It's too much of a burden on you. It's too stressful for you. And a friend called me to visit him in Cambria and I did and lo and behold, we're walking down right the street here and we saw a sign for sale and I looked at the house. I like climbed the stairs, looked at the ocean and I said to my wife, I think so. She said, yes. And we both decided to buy the house. We spent two weeks here and then four weeks and then six weeks. And then we got to like it so much that we stayed here full time. And I hardly ever went to Los Angeles. So the question was. <laughs> the question was about how you started painting. Yes, yes. So when I got to Cambria here, I went to the theater. To the, there's a little theater here. I went there to make the acquaintance of the owner, the director. And there I met a guy who was a painter. He was an important painter in this area, Art Van Rijn, a wonderful guy. He invited me to join their group of painters. They were called the Wednesday Regulars because you can come or not. That's why they're regular. I went there and met the people and then we decided where to go. And they decided that uh, the top of the mountain top on road 46 would be good. We went there and it was just beautiful up there. And after a few minutes up there, all of the painters went to their corners to see the view, whatever view they wanted to see. And they were so concentrated that you can cut the, the, the concentration with a knife. It's so thick. After two and a half hours or so, we all went to have lunch. And there they had a critique where each would critique each other's painting very carefully, very kindly, not to hurt your feelings. And I saw. Before there were some 24 blank canvases and now on those were 24 beautiful paintings. I thought I'd like to do that. I've been exposed to painting in my, all my life because my father was a painter and so forth. I thought it was time for me to paint. I got so involved in that, that uh, I took the car out of my garage and made that into my painting studio. And sometimes I painted in two, three in the morning. I turned out about 200 more pa paintings at that time. And uh, one day early in my painting, there was a painting of a tree that I made. Somebody said, why don't you put it in the exhibit? And I thought, well, yeah, yeah, go ahead, put it in. I put it in and it was sold for $70. That's when I lost my virginity as a painter and I started to paint not for me, but for others. Anyway, the point is that my, it's, that's been about 30 years ago now. These were my golden years and what made them so golden and so wonderful was the fact that I painted. It really fed me. It was so exciting for me to paint. And I learned this, that from the conversation with them. Slowly I learned that everything that I learned I could throw out because what I want to do is really do it my way. And sometimes I would just take paint and throw it at the paint, at the canvas. Sometimes I do one thing or another. But uh, I developed a sort of a style of my own and um, started selling. And thank God I'm doing well. Good. Uh, I know that we, um, we've used up most of our time and I've loved hearing these stories. I think the last question I want to ask you is just when you think back on your incredible career, what moment stands out for you as something that you're the most proud of? Mm. Probably most proud of my one man show, Shalom Aleichem, in which I'll tell you the story of that if we have time. Yes. I was in New York doing Naked City. My agent said that uh, Jerome Robbins wants to see you for, to play Tevye in Fiddler on the Roof because the understudy was supposed to do it, but he won't do it. I went there and I read for uh, Robbins. Uh, I sang for him and he said, fine, that's good, that's good. But there's another part I want you to do, but maybe you want to do it on Friday. It's about the time when he comes home drunk after the party of To Life, To Life, L'chaim. So I said, okay, I went and I studied the part and uh, there was no call for me on Friday by Friday. So I called my agent, my agent said they'd come to, to an agreement with the understudy that he would take the thing on the road and I was terribly annoyed. 
On the way to the airport to go to LA, I stopped at a bookstore and picked up a book. They happened to have a book of Shalom Aleichem stories. Shalom Aleichem was the man who wrote the story for Fiddler on the Roof. I read the stories and they were so wonderful that I thought, you don't need singers, you don't need dancers, you don't need music. All you have to do is get up on the stage and simply tell the Shalom Aleichem stories. That's when I decided to do a one-man show. And I worked nine months on it. And then we opened in New York. After the opening, the critics came to a party we threw in at the Jewish delicatessen. And they stayed till about three o'clock. And eventually that year, they gave me a special award. After that, I went to San Francisco. When we finished a three-month run in San Francisco, my director called me, my producer called me. And he said, uh, I want you to come up here because you're nominated for best actor and best show. I said, I don't want to go up there because I don't want to sit there and then have somebody else get the award and then I have to afford and everything. But he said, no, 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 don't worry about that. Yours was the only name nominated for both categories. That's extraordinary because there's some wonderful plays done that year. And I got there and I got the awards. And that's when a man from Australia came and he offered me a job to do Shalom Aleichem in Australia, in Melbourne, Sydney, Adelaide, and so on. So your answer, your question was? It was about what uh, moment in your career were you most proud of? And it sounds like this show was. Yes. Uh, also, the, the plays that are best received, for example, I did uh, on Playhouse 90, I did uh, the part of uh, Pablo in For Whom the Bell Tolls which won me a special, not a special, but a Supporting Actors Award for the year. Laurence Olivier won the Best Actor Award. And so we, I like that. I also like Some Like It Hot because it's been such a hit. And I, I hear fans write me about it, Some Like It Hot. I, I enjoy doing it and, and I'm glad I did because it's done so much for me. Yes. I mean, I could ask you so many more questions, but what I want everyone to do is to buy your book, which is full of these stories. And I'm so glad to have had a chance to meet you and talk to you a little bit. Um, and I know that the audience will appreciate it too. It is wonderful to hear straight from you about, about these experiences. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for mentioning my book. I forgot about that. <laughs> I'm here to remind people it is available and you can order it and read more about all these yeah. incredible stories. I'm surprised really at all the wonderful reviews it's gotten. As a writer, I never, I was very uncertain whether to publish it or not. And finally, when I did publish it, I was amazed at the acceptance of me as a writer. It's fantastic. The next time we get together, we'll have to talk about the secrets to your longevity so that everyone listening can live to be 102. But maybe we'll save that for another conversation. Great. Okay. Thank Sounds you. Good. I enjoyed myself very much talking to you. Thank you.